This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome new listeners joining us in Texas, Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, Arizona, California, New York, and from coast to coast, including friends in Alaska and Hawaii. I also want to take a moment to welcome our men and women in uniform who are joining us from remote outposts over the Internet. Thank you for your letters and emails and for catapulting the Costa Report to the number one independent news program in the country. In just a moment... General Michael Flynn will be joining us to talk about why the U.S. has failed to stop Islamic terrorist groups from growing and what must be done to stop them now. So turn up that dial because we're going to get to the bottom of some facts that have not only been kept out of the headlines, but have been swept under the rug by many government leaders. But before General Flynn joins the program, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Michael Flynn was born in Middletown, Rhode Island. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Rhode Island and graduate degrees from Golden Gate University and the Naval War College. Flynn joined the U.S. Army in 1981 and has had a distinguished military career, including tours in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other hot spots. By 2004, Flynn found himself serving as the Director of Intelligence for Joint Special Operations Command, and from here, as the Director of Intelligence of U.S. Central Command. Then in 2011, Flynn was promoted to Lieutenant General and assigned to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Six months later, President Obama nominated Flynn to become the 18th director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, a position Flynn stepped down from in 2014. A lifelong Democrat, Flynn surprised everyone with his endorsement of Donald Trump and vocal criticism of how the U.S. has responded to the threat of Islamic terrorism. His new book titled Field of Flight lays out a clear strategy for destroying ISIS and other dangerous factions, something that we're going to hear more about later in today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, General Michael Flynn. Thank you for joining us today, General. Well, thank you so much for having me. And can I call you Rebecca, I guess, huh? Absolutely. (laughs) But I'm going to I'm from a military family, so I'm going to stick to general if it's all right with you. (laughs) Otherwise, I I think I'm going to get a a spanking from my dad. And uh, he reminds me I'm not too old. (laughs) I I think it's fair to say that regardless of uh, who assumes the White House job or a job as commander in chief, the military has a job to do, and that is to protect the interests and the citizens of the United States. So let's talk about these letters that have recently been signed by military leaders who oppose and also who support Mm -hmm. Donald Trump. What what do you Mm -hmm. say to folks who believe military leaders, like members of the media, ought to remain neutral? They ought to stay out of the fight. Yeah, I don't agree. I don't agree at all. I mean, there's a point in time, you know, when you're done serving in the military, you know, like like those of us that serve as, you know, for 20 years or 30 years, or in my case, almost 34 years, you, you know, and you depart the service, you know, you don't stop being an American citizen caring for the future of this country. And I have children, I have grandchildren, and I care about the direction uh, that this country is going. I don't think it's going in the right direction. And so I made a very conscious decision when I, when I got out that uh, I felt very strongly, and I was helping actually five of the candidates on the Republican side, uh, because I didn't like any of the candidates on the Democratic side. And, and so and then it ended up with Mr. Trump. And here I am, uh, you know, uh, acting in an advisory role to Mr. Trump. So uh, we, we sh- no one should ever feel like they have to, you know, sort of hang up their 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 conscience, their 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 thinking, their belief system, their values, their principles. You know, when you when you depart the service. In fact, I want I encourage and I would love to see more of our men and women, uh, even if they only serve, you know, one tour as a, and get out as a, as a corporal or a sergeant, I would love to see more of them get involved in local, state, and national uh, politics because of just the level of corruption that we have in our, particularly in our federal government today. It's just extraordinary. 
Well, it speaks volumes that five of the GOP leading candidates sought you out for advice and your opinions. Now, on the one hand, no one knows or understands a security threat to the U.S. better than those who head up military intelligence. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, is there danger that the military may become polarized like we see leaders in Washington becoming? I mean, isn't the politicization of the military a little dangerous? Well, it, it always is. I mean, we always have to we always have to guard against that. I mean, the the uh, the real uh, need for our uh, our military to have civilian you know civilian control of the military is paramount in our system in our in our republic, and it and it needs to be uh, it needs to continue to stay that way. What we have to be um, careful of, though, is that you know this is what I tell as I've counseled many many particularly officers, but even even uh, even senior non commissioned officers. You know, there's a point in time in your career, especially for those of us that have, have spent our lives doing this, where intellectual courage becomes even more important sometimes than physical courage. You know, we expect physical courage on the battlefield, uh, but it, what's, what's harder sometimes is the intellectual courage to, to really say what you believe is true and, and to say it up the chain of command as much as it is to say it down the chain of command. And I, and I, I really encourage our, your listeners, your our the people that are certainly still serving in the military, to understand what I just said, you have got to have the intellectual courage, the fortitude, and, and, the, and the ability to be able to say, hey, the emperor doesn't have any clothes, and this isn't working. Now, if you're directed to go do something, and it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, then you have a responsibility to, to carry out that order. If you don't feel like you can carry out that order, even though it meets those, that sort of test, I, I guess, if you will, then you have to make another decision about whether you want to continue to serve in our armed forces. And, and to me, and, and I think this is really where it comes down to, when you become a more senior officer, and certainly our senior non-commissioned officers, but the senior officers, the general officers, if you will, the flag officers, all this business about generals and admirals that you've heard in the media lately, I mean, all of them, all of us, care deeply about this country. Now, we're going to have our, we're going to have our different views about politics, I guess. I mean, I got, you know, last time I was in politics, I was a senior in high school. I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy this political cesspool that we have in this country right now, but it is what we have. It is what it is. You know, it is what we have. So, um, you know, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we, we present with, with people who have the experience uh, to be able to talk to some of the issues that we are facing. I mean, you know, and maybe we'll walk around the world here. And I don't know how much, you know, I'm on my soapbox right now. And I'm telling you, we, the next president of the United States and, the, and this country, our country, my country, faces perils unseen in the last 50 to 75 years. And, and it's everything from, you know, it's everything from what Russia is up to, both physically and on the Internet. It's up it's all the all of the baloney that, that the Chinese keep spewing that, you know, they the big handshake between President Obama and President Xi out of China about how China was going to stop attacking us on the, on the Internet, and they, and, they, and they haven't done it. All the stuff that they're doing in the South China Sea, you've got, a, you've got a 30-something with the potential for nuclear weapons in North Korea, and God knows you know, what's on his mind at, a, at any given time. And then the entire mess throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia with the rise of the Islamic State – Despite what tactical victories we might have in uh, places like Mosul or Aleppo or, or in, in Ramadi or wherever, in, in our places like Iraq, this ideology has expanded globally. I mean, we're talking 25, 30 countries now that have had attacks in them in, the, you know, in just the last few months. So, uh, I mean, this is bad. This is a very bad thing. So this is the, this is the plate that, the, that our current administration is handing with a bunch of failed you know, foreign policy, this is the plate that they're handing to the next president. And, and that president has to be ready. Well, I'll tell you, that president is uh, inheriting quite a mess. Uh, and uh, I think the American people are aware of that. Uh, but uh, it's a question of who's best qualified at this point right. to clean that mess up. Uh, we have to take our first break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from General Michael Flynn. You're listening to the Costa Report. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. 
It is everything around us, all of nature, but human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. Excitement's in the air. Family fun for everyone. The Santa Cruz County Fair. Only the Santa Cruz County Fair can pack this much fun into five full days. From Wednesday, September 14th through Sunday the 18th, the fair once again becomes the showcase of the county. Come and see the creative works your friends and neighbors have entered. And while you're at the fair, plan to have some fun, too. There's racing pigs, stampeding turkeys, Captain Jack the Pirate, and the Frisbee Dogs are all back. Rocket's Canine Comets are returning, and again this year they're supporting a cause close to their hearts. Pet Adoption. The Puppy Palooza will surround their performance arena with adorable, adoptable dogs. And last year's new additions are back too, including Twinkle Time and the Monster Truck Show on opening night. Check online for details and discount tickets at SantaCruzCountyFair.com. Do you have a plan for your money? Does your money come and go like the tides? Do you just leave your finances to fate? Cash is always flowing, money is always moving, and if you don't manage it, it will move away from you. So many people actually spend more time planning their next trip to the dentist than they do something even more important like their retirement. You know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Don't leave your financial future to fate. Take charge. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Money Moves is dedicated to providing you tips and tools so you can manage your own money effectively. No one cares about your money more than you do. Therefore, you need the skills to manage your money. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is the former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Michael Flynn, whose recent book, Field of Flight, lays out a compelling strategy for how the next president of the United States can defeat Islamic terrorism. And before the break, you were pointing out the fact that terrorism has been allowed to spread uh, and also grow in strength all around the world. And along those lines, you've pointed out that we often seem to be more concerned with where rather than why terrorism is spreading. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, exactly. And in fact, in fact, we have not been able to address the question why very well by the last couple of administrations. We were very good about where we wanted to go, you know, and we probably went to too many places. In fact, we, I know we went to too many places. 
Um, but why? Why is this? Why is this ideology spreading? And it, why does it seem to have so much support? And and it's something that you know. Again, we've been 15 years participating in this perpetual conflict, and at some point in time, we have to decide that we're going to actually win. That's number one. The the why of this thing, you know, it, it gets back to when we have presidents and particularly the current administration that refuses, I mean, just refuses to clearly define and identify the enemy that we are facing, you know, and, and rolls them up under criminal criminals and other sort of extremists that are out there. That is, that does a disservice, frankly, to all of us who have ever served in the military, who have had to fight an enemy. And, and I, I as a guy who has, who has had to define many of our enemies over, over many decades, uh, you know, if I ever walked into a boss and said, you know, I'm not really sure who we're facing today, and I can't really clearly define him, I, I should have been fired. And and yet our president, you know, he, he acts as though, well, it doesn't really matter what we call him. Yes, it does, because we are facing a virulent cancer that has metastasized inside of the Islamic ideology. And the numbers aren't like 10 or 20,000 in Iraq and Syria. You know, we're, we're talking about maybe maybe it's 1% of the Islamic uh, world, which could be as many as a million people if you're talking about 1.7 billion Muslims on the planet. So, so this is a very serious problem. And when we see the growth of it in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, in the uh, Middle East, of course, in, in Central Asia and Southeast Asia, I mean, this is a very, very significant problem. And it's a problem that, that uh, you know, ideologically we're going to have to deal with, just like we did with communism. We dealt with communism for for damn near 40 years to defeat that ideology. And but there is a difference little... here. There, there's a difference here in that this is tainted with religion. I mean, we're a country it, that it, was based yeah, on religious sure. freedom, and, and it's very hard when, uh, when a, a group, uh, a, a state, says we're waging a religious war, and we don't want to be engaged in a religious war. We're, we're waging a war on terrorism, not on religion. So there seems so to be this we're, just we're disconnect. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rebecca. No, no, I, I, you're right. It, it, it's a big disconnect because we are waging a war against a political ideology. And the political ideology is radical Islamism. This is a political ideology. It, it's totalitarian, just like communism is and, you know, and remains. Uh, so, so, you know, there's an interesting thing. And I write about this in the book quite a bit, you know, this sort of equality between totalitarian regimes and, and this radical, these radical Islamist regimes, how they treat their people, how they, how, you know, the structures that they use, the way that they, the, the, the certain type of legal system. I mean, it's a bit different in the Islamic ideology than it is in the communist ideology. But, they, you know, then I'm really talking about the notion of Sharia law and how Sharia law is applied, um, you know. And we don't even mention, I mean, I, you know, and I, I really go into some depth in the book about Iran. I mean, Iran is still... That according to our own State Department, the leading state sponsor of radical Islamic terrorism. And so, I mean, that, that's been designated as of 1984 during the Reagan administration, and it's still there. They are still at the top of the list today. So yet here we are dealing with a country and everybody, I think all of your listeners have seen the 400 million, the one point, you know, two billion or now it's one point seven billion, you know, Ransom fee for hostages, the 150 billion that we're giving them back in the uh, in the uh, the nuclear deal, and the and a, we're giving the leading state sponsor of terror, terrorism a pathway to a nuclear bomb. I mean, how how insane is that? I mean, it's just I can't say it any other way. I mean, that, the, for us to be able to to cut a deal like that, and for anybody, and for you know, frankly, for one of the candidates, Hillary Clinton, in this case, to say that you know this is going to lead to to opening of of relationships, I mean, they have have already violated, Iran has already violated this this so-called deal a bunch of times just this year. I mean, with the firing of ballistic missiles there, you know, I, I say this a bit tongue-in-cheek, but their, their national anthem seems to be death to America. Well, how death should we be dealing with Iran? I mean, I, I understand your position, but yeah. what do you do with a terrorist state? Well, I, you know what? We were doing just fine with them under a, under an economic blockade and a big economic blockade, and they were they were at a point where you know honestly you know there's there's many other things that we could have done. And frankly, looking back, we probably should have done that with Iraq as well 
and we made some really dumb decisions in the early part of last decade, and then even you know even dumber decisions when we pulled out of Iraq in two. But there's also the contrarian view that when you back these, you economically back these countries uh-huh. into a corner, you do what we did with Japan. You make them desperate, and desperate nations do desperate things. But look at Japan today. I mean, you look at Japan. Well, that's today. true, so, but I'm not, I'm not so sure. We, I'm not so sure Japan was backed into a corner. Actually, Japan struck out of us just like, just like uh, Al Qaeda struck out of us on 9/11. I mean, I, I'm not. I don't. I don't necessarily buy the backing into a corner issue on on Japan. Japan aligned themselves with Germany, decided that they wanted you know dominant. They wanted dominant global power, and they and they uh, in the in the 30s all the way up until the time we entered the war in World War II. Um, they, you know, they were attacking deep into Manchuria and down into all, all the way down into Singapore and started in the East Asia or Southeast Asia. So well, that is true, but that? but I, yeah. you know, I, I, well, then let's point to a more recent example. North Korea is an example. I mean, sure. the North Korean people are starving to death. That doesn't seem to be uh, quashing their ambitions to develop nuclear weapons, uh, as far as the government's concerned. It doesn't yeah, seem you know, to be that- working. Well, because China backs North Korea. China continues to use North Korea as a buffer against where what they perceive as their threats, which is principally Japan and the United States, to a degree South Korea. But yes. you know, we say we say that this and this is a country that's that's under duress, North Korea now. This is a country yes. that's under duress. But they also have a very sophisticated cyber capability. They have a very sophisticated weapons capability. They have a large army and China backs them. So there has to be a different relationship that we have with China. I mean, I, I, I watch, and I've been, I, you know, I, I advised to a degree, and I supported, you know, various leaders in our in our political uh, hierarchy, and they went around the world on different trips to to go visit with world leaders, you know, and I'm, I'm watching our our current leadership and how other countries are dealing with our president. I think I, I believe in such a disrespectful way, yes. and you know, I mean, here here's. Here's President Obama meeting with President Putin just a couple of days ago, and 24 hours after the fact, a Russian jet, I mean, literally is 20 feet away from a, from a U.S. Uh, naval, I believe it was a U.S. naval aircraft, flying around out in the Pacific. I know. It was, it was pretty unbelievable that that had happened. <laughs> Very offensive. Now, we have to take another commercial break, but stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to find out why General Flynn claims there may be as many as 1,000 ISIS members residing in the U.S. today. You're listening to the Costa Report. In the opening of All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remark wrote, This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will simply try to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Today, Project Healing Waters offers men and women that have escaped the shells of war the opportunity to heal by teaching our returning veterans to fly fish in some of the most beautiful, tranquil rivers in our country. These natural surroundings have the ability to restore the human spirit, and with your help, Project Healing Waters is able to reach out to thousands of our men and women in the military every year. For information on how you can help, go to projecthealingwaters.org. Please give and give generously to those who have put their lives on the line for you. That's projecthealingwaters.org. Help those who have escaped the shells of war and need your help to come all the way back. On Saturday, September 10th, Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks will host its fourth annual Mole and Mariachi Festival, featuring great local food, music, wine, and beer, as well as artisan crafts, raffle, and fun for kids of all ages. Free admission, so bring the whole family on September 10th, and don't forget to vote for your favorite mole prepared by local chefs. Brought to you in part by KSCO. All proceeds benefit Santa Cruz Mission State Historic Park. More info at www.thatsmypark.org. Now that the kids are back in school, let's go back in time. Not very long ago, to the years of deep education cuts that hurt our children in schools. Remember? 30,000 teachers laid off. Larger class sizes, art and music programs eliminated. It was devastating. And it's why we need to vote yes on Proposition 55. Because Prop 55 prevents $4 billion in new education cuts simply by maintaining the current tax rate on the wealthiest Californians. 
And Prop 55 provides strict and specific requirements for accountability and transparency, ensuring the money goes directly to our classrooms, not to administrative costs. We can't go back to cuts that hurt our kids. So help our children thrive by voting yes on 55. Paid for by yes on 55, Californians for Budget Stability. Sponsored by teachers, health care providers, doctors, and labor organizations. Major funding by California Hospitals Committee on Issues. Sponsored by California Association of Hospitals and Health Systems and California Teachers Association Issues PAC Committee. Hi, I'm Celeste Friedman, inviting you to Bubbles, Bangles, and Bows. Join the Watsonville Soroptimus at our annual fundraiser Saturday, September 10th from 3 to 8 at the Seascape Golf Club. Enjoy live music by Travis Palmer, excellent edibles by Chef Jeff Hickson, bid at Terry Medina's auction, and wash it all down with ice-cold champagne. Call Joanne Veer for reservations at 724-8622. That's 724-8622. We're headed for the warmest weather of the year. I'm Charles Friedman. Before you turn on that air conditioner up to max, give a thought to the safety of all the electrical circuits that keep you cool. Best way to check on the safety of your electrical circuits is with the help of Chris Jensen and the staff at JM Electric. Chris, what should we be watching out for? Thanks, Charles. It is really important to be mindful of the electrical circuits that power air conditioners. Any electrical leak from these circuits is a real fire danger. You may not be able to see the electricity leaking from the circuits behind your walls, but JM Electric's state-of-the-art testing equipment can find them. And JM Electric is happy to help folks out with a free home assessment to see if the current safe testing service is right for your home. Give us a call at 422-7819. Go straight to jmelectric.com and take the home electric safety test. After you answer 12 yes or no questions, you'll have a good idea about how safe to feel. If you don't feel safe, call JM Electric and ask for a free current safe home assessment. That's JM Electric at 422-7819. You'll sleep well at night. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is General Michael Flynn. And before we had to take a hard break, we were speaking about how to deal with terrorist states such as Iran and North Korea. And you were pointing out that China is supporting North Korea, and we also have issues with terrorist states being supported by Russia. And I wanted to give you an opportunity, General, to finish your thoughts there. Yeah, and I talk about this in, in the book, and I appreciate you highlighting the book, and it's the field of fight, how we can win the global war against radical Islam and its allies. And, and it's a and it's a big-time bestseller, and I really appreciate that. It's a terrific and, you know, book, I'll tell you. I, I couldn't I, – I'm going to recommend people don't pick it up and start reading it late at night because you're probably not going to get much sleep. <laughs> it's hard to put down. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for saying that. Uh, you know – uh, this is a message. The, the book is a message, and it's a book about what we face. And it's not just radical Islam. It's it, it is part of the of the subtitle of the book and its allies. And I address some of these allies, and Russia is one of them. Uh, Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea. And so these are you know these are these are part and parcel of these you know again these t- sort of totalitarian regimes that align themselves with radical Islamic views and, and regimes that we have around the world. And what we have to do, and I lay this out in, in, a, in a chapter titled How to Win, and I talk about, you know, just, we have to destroy the jihadi armies, kill or capture their leaders, and capturing their leaders is very, very important. You don't hear about that, us doing that anymore because we don't. And, and, and our current president, he's going to unload uh, the Guantanamo Bay here before he gets out of office because it was a political promise. And we know, we know publicly, we know that a third of those that, that served in Guantanamo have returned to the battlefield, and we know that they have returned to killing Americans. We know that for a fact. That's number one. We have to be able to continue to destroy these guys, kill them wherever they are, and capture them to be able to gain the valuable intelligence. The second thing is we've got to, as I've already highlighted, we've got to discredit this ideology, you know, which is, which is helped by the military victories that we have. I mean, these guys believe that Allah is going to you know, lead them to victory. Well, every time we've beaten them, what we ought to do is we ought to, we ought to publicly be talking about that. You know, the, we ought to be able to say that we are beating these guys on the battlefield. And in fact, when we do, we should publicly say it. We should be proud of the fact that we beat them on the battlefield. In fact, we've always beaten them on the battlefield. One, one of the questions you asked, which I thought mm-hmm. really cut to the heart of it, is to ask them when we have a military victory, do you think Allah switched sides? 
Exactly. Exactly. And it, it really, it really brings the ideology into focus. Right. Exactly. And then, you know, and I also call for the creation. And this is where our imagination has to really kick in and our ability to be creative as Americans, you know, and how we, how we create alliances. But I call for a new 21st century alliance. And the way I describe it is sort of like a, like a, uh, an Arab NATO like force. And we, we must, Rebecca, we must take to task the Arab world and they have to do more about this problem. And we should have embraced uh, President al-Sisi of Egypt when he gave such a brave speech in Cairo back in the late part of 2014, early 2015, so not that long ago. And yet we, we did not embrace that. He, he basically called for a, a revolution or a reformation inside of the ideology of Islam. We should, we should embrace some of these other leaders who have called for, you know, the, they, they have stated publicly what their problems are. But the U.S., for some reason, our current administration, this goes back, you know, all the way back to the beginning with uh, Secretary Clinton as well as currently Secretary Kerry. For some reason, we're embracing Iran instead of these other countries. But we need a new 21st century alliance. Well, let's talk about this NATO-like organization in the Middle East, because I am excited about that idea. That was one of the ideas that I that kept me up at night. Um, for people that are not familiar uh, with NATO, one of the tenets of NATO is you attack one country, it's the same as attacking any of the NATO members, right? We, we are all obligated to defend and retaliate uh, if one country is attacked. But all eyes are on NATO right now. France, Germany, Turkey, the U.S. have all been attacked. Yeah, exactly. And everyone's now looking at NATO and saying, okay, what's NATO's position? Yeah, and, you know, and I'll tell you, NATO doesn't have a position. NATO does not. I mean, the problem with NATO is it's consensus driven. And I've been to these ministerials, both defense and and, uh, foreign minister ministerials, and listened to some of these, these countries talk as though, you know, I mean, I, I listen to them and I say to myself, oh, my God, no wonder there's so it's so difficult to get anything done, you know, right now. And frankly, the other part, the other problem that exists is this refugee problem, this massive refugee problem. Uh, Germany, Germany is at, at a place now where they don't even really not have a good hard number on how many refugees from Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq that they've let, let into their country. And I think that their number is, is around four million. And they, they're having some serious problems, as is France. So it, this business about taking the task, the Arab world, and back to this creation of, a, of, a, of an Arab NATO. I think it's an excellent idea. Why yeah, haven't we, we have. moved in that direction of, of allowing them to get together, to get these states? Maybe I'll see, you know, if we had backed him yeah. and said, let's put this organization together so that if you attack any one of these countries, that we're going to defend as a group, as critical mass, because what seems to be lacking is some effort toward critical mass. Exactly. I mean, it, precisely. And, you know, and this kind of a, this creation of this sort of, you know, this new 21st century uh, global alliance, particularly where the, where the Muslim world comes in, you know, it, you know, it will emerge really naturally from the middle, uh, from both military and, uh, and the political campaign that has to ensue. And then really we have to bring a direct challenge. It's sort of the final point, uh, Rebecca, on, on how to win. And this is, I lay this out in, uh, in fair detail in, in one of the chapters is we have to bring a direct challenge to the regimes that support our enemies. We have to weaken them at a minimum through economic means, through diplomatic means. And, and where, where necessary, if they have to be brought down, we have to bring them down. But we have to be smart about it, not like what we did in Iraq or what we did in, in, uh, in Libya and, and elsewhere, uh, but particularly those two places where we had no plan for the day after. We are so good taking down these dictators, and yet, You'd think that, that when people are sitting around in the White House situation room, that they would sit there and go, OK, so we're going to, you know, we're going to take down Saddam or we're going to leave this country. You know, we're going to leave in 2011 like we did out of Iraq. Or we're going to go take down the Gaddafi. Do you think anybody would ever ask the question, well, what's going to happen when we do? Because we're going to do it. The mili- you give the military that order, our military is damn good and we're going to do it. And, I'll and tell you who I hear this from. from. I hear it from the military physicians who set up uh, hospitals in these areas, yeah. invite all the local citizens to come in, and then they receive the military order that they're pulling out. 
Uh, there's no doctors there. There's no nobody that knows how to use the sophisticated equipment. And suddenly now they've gotten the they've won the hearts and minds of the local population. And now one day they're just packing up and moving out. Uh, it shows a complete lack of understanding that once you get in there, you it, look what we did in Japan. Japan is a perfect model. Yeah of yeah. what we're capable of doing. I don't know why. You know, I lived in Japan yeah. for 16 years, General, and mm-hmm. we don't have a stronger ally than the Japanese. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree. I'm a big fan. I have a lot of friends in Japan. I have a lot of friends in Korea. I have a lot of friends in Europe. And and, and how did how did General MacArthur accomplish that? He, he accomplished it by going in and saying, we're not pulling out of here. We're going to help rebuild Right. And we're going to we're going to work lockstep with the Japanese to build a true democracy. And they did. Yeah. And, and they, they did. And, 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 and they did. And Japan, as you as you well know, Japan is a trillion dollar economy today. I mean, they're one of the strongest economies in the world. And, you know, and so so part of this is that the 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 Arab world. And I know this. I mean, many of the many of the of the Muslim leaders know that they have a problem. They need U.S. leadership to step up. I mean, and again, I, I address this in my book about from some of the intellectuals in the in the Muslim world who actually look at us and and they say to us, you know, don't don't look at us like, you know, don't see us as a bunch of idiots. I mean, we know we have a problem, but we need your help. We need you to be able to say the right things, to do the right things diplomatically, politically, informationally. And we just don't do it right now. General, we have to take our last break, but we'll be right back to hear more about General Michael Flynn's book, Field of Flight. If you don't have a copy, go out and get one right now. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top-tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best U.S. Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com, or reach us by phone, 831-622-7722. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, Big Data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. Paid for by Noah and Z. Stop the oil and gas shutdown. Major funding by Era Energy LLC and Chevron Corporation. Sometimes things aren't quite what they appear to be at first glance. That's the case with Measure Z, the energy shutdown measure on Monterey's November ballot. Monterey County has been safely producing oil under the most stringent environmental regulations in the world for nearly 70 years. But now a deceptive ballot measure could pull the plug on our long history of safe energy production. Experts say we'll lose nearly 1,000 good-paying jobs in Monterey, 1,000 people in the county out of work, and Measure Z will cause the county to lose nearly $200 million in economic output and we'll lose millions more in tax revenue for already underfunded local services, like our police and fire departments and our overcrowded schools. 
That's why the Monterey County Farm Bureau, the Monterey County Deputy Sheriff's Association, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of the Central Coast have all come together to urge you to vote no on the energy shutdown measure in November. I'm Governor Gary Johnson, candidate for president of the United States, and I approve this message. Like 60% of you, I'm not impressed by the two-party system. It's a dinosaur. It's outmoded and no longer reflects today's America. Two-party politics doesn't work, and it hasn't worked for anybody but itself in decades. If we the people are wise, we will never again elect another president from within the entrenched, corrupt, co-opted two-party system. The office of president should serve the needs of everyone equally with respect and with fairness. I did it as governor. I'll do it as president. Google me. 60% of you have said you want another choice in 2016, and now you have one in me. We the people have a chance to do something in 2016 that may not come around again in our lifetimes. We have a legitimate chance to elect one of our own to the highest office in the land. Our best America yet. Johnson Weld. 2016. Paid for by Gary Johnson 2016. Back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and we are speaking today with General Michael Flynn, whose riveting new book, Field of Flight, lays out a clear plan for defeating Islamic terrorists and their sponsors. And before the break, we were talking about a need to have a detailed plan for what to do once our military prevails in places such as Iran and Afghanistan. Hi, Rebecca. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, do you want me to keep going? Yes, absolutely. We're oh, we're back on we're back on the air, General, yeah. and I appreciate okay. you uh, staying with us. This is such an important topic, and you know, oftentimes I watch you on these uh, television shows and and mm-hmm. new and uh, the major networks, and they and they give you all of three minutes to talk. Yeah, and you know, yeah. these are yeah. not yeah. these are not simple issues. We we can't get to anything. We we can't get to anything of substance in two minutes. So I really appreciate yeah. you laying the story out. Out for the folks that are listening today, we've got two and a half million listeners across the United States, and they want to, you know, they're intelligent people. They want to, they want the full story. So uh, this yeah, is absolutely. why, you know, we we try to we try to get a little bit more in depth. So appreciate you hanging in there. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that we don't seem to have an after the victory plan as we did in Japan, as an example. Yeah, and that's and exactly we we continue and we do not learn lessons very well we continue to go into these conflicts into these wars without you know any any real afterthought as to what we're going to do next i mean it's and you know i just when i look at the last 15 years alone never mind the last you know 45 or so we, we just have done a poor job of that and 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 this to me this is this is just practical common sense for the military perspective you know, I know, and this is where this is where there is a bit of a, you know, I challenge our military leaders, those that are still in uniform at the senior ranks, you know, to sit there when they're in, when they're in these sessions with the political policy makers, the politicians, and the politicians want to go do something that we know is going to cost American lives, and it's going to place our families, you know, at sacrifice. It's going to place the, the men and women in uniform at sacrifice. I mean, this is unbelievable. If you sit there and you say, okay, we're, we're ready to go, and you don't know what is next, I mean, we cannot, we cannot participate in perpetual conflict any longer. There was a report that came out about just a couple of days ago, Rebecca, that uh, two days ago now, I, th- I think, it, it, the report showed that the cost of the war since 9-11 up till this point has cost a, our country $6 trillion. That's an unimaginable number for anybody. And and but it's a, it's a, it's unbelievable. And to me, I mean, so so when is this thing going to end? I mean, this president has already demonstrated that he can't end it. He's he's you know he's sort of thrown his hands up in the air. And part of it is because they just have a l- lousy strategy that we're following that we're executing. Our great military, our great men and women in, in our in the uniform, and their families. And I never want to forget the families that are sort of the backbone of, of our military and they're and they're in there fighting tooth and nail, hanging behind and sacrificing, just like our men and women who are serving in combat do, they will go and they will do whatever they're asked to do like they continually do. 
and we go on these rotation after rotation after rotation. I've had one of my sons do three rotations into Afghanistan. I mean, I, I, I am not going to sit as an American. Now, I'm back to your very first question at the very top of the hour when we started. I am an American, and I believe in the future of this country. Our country is going in the wrong direction. We cannot afford to stay in perpetual conflict any longer. And there is no enemy that's unbeatable. This enemy is very beatable. And we shouldn't go, all oh, these guys are everywhere. No, we can go beat these guys. And we, but we have to use some creativity and imagination. And we have to be able to go in there and sort of, you know, untie the hands of our military leaders. And that was really, you know, I mean, I think the big point that has come out is that our military leaders, they have their hands tied. You know, I mean, when, when, and I'll give you one example, 120 vehicle convoy departing Mosul and they're taking, you know, the ill gotten goods out of there, like oil and some other, and some other things that they're going to sell on the black market. And our, our air power, quote unquote air power, who could destroy those things in a matter of seconds, could, could destroy that 120 vehicle convoy. They were not allowed to shoot that convoy because because of potential quote unquote collateral damage. Now, so I mean, this is a this is a military logistics convoy that the Islamic State is using to to basically fund their efforts. We we had good information on this is just recently, this is like in the last two months. And our military was not allowed to shoot it. So I bring out some of these examples in our book. Now let me jump. I'm gonna jump real quick because of time, Rebecca, to the homeland. Okay? Yes, I, I, you have said yeah. that you think that there's as many as 1,000 uh, Islamic State supporters residing in the U.S. I think everyone's horrified by that number. Yeah, yeah, actually, and actually it's, it's, it's potentially worse than that. I mean, the, the FBI director has stated that they have at least 1,000 cases in play that are Islamic State related, and they have them in all 50 states. So... The, the size of the problem is probably worse than we believe. And this gets back to all this nonsense, and but especially coming out of the leadership and the administration and the leadership uh, in the Homeland Security about, you know, all these movements that we have. We, we should be, you know, cherishing our men and women that are in our law enforcement that are our law enforcement professionals at federal, state, local, and tribal levels and give them the resources, give them the things that they need. You know, we, we have, well, to back up one second, we don't even know how many illegal immigrants we have in this country. We do not have a good idea about that number. People just say it's about 20 million. Uh, that number, you know, we've been, we've been saying that number for about five or six years. Right. I used, to live on the, I used to live on the southern border of this country. I lived there for a couple of years at different times. And they would routinely catch hundreds, if not thousands, of illegals crossing the border all the time. And now we know, we know that the Islamic State and we know that organizations like Hezbollah, which is the terrorist arm of Iran, have said that they are going to infiltrate into some of these refugee flows coming into our country. So... I, mean, we, I, I will tell you something, General. I, I thought it was very brave after the attack in Brussels that the Brussels mm -hmm. police came forward and said, we don't have near the manpower to follow every possible exactly. terrorist in our country. And I thought that was incredibly brave to admit they don't have the bandwidth to do it. They're yeah, they completely and overwhelmed. Yeah. And I, I thought that more... Uh, law enforcement individuals would come forward in other countries, and some did, and said, we have the same situation uh, right now as well. Uh, I don't do. see how you can fo possibly have enough manpower to follow every one of these cases. Well, well I mean, part of it is, and so, and so, so we, do need to, we do need to increase the, the resources, the manpower in these organizations, particularly organizations like Immigration and Customs, our Customs and Border Patrol, I mean, they need the resources, and they need some of the technologies that we can bring to bear, too. I mean, you would be stunned at what they uh, have to use. I mean, I know what our best forces in the military use, and we have some really uh, some great capabilities. Our law enforcement professionals in certain cities and certain places are okay, and they do a pretty good job with what they have. But at the federal level, I mean, they're under-resourced, they're undermanned, and they're overwhelmed. 
And yes, and I, I, I think in, the, in my book, in my book, I, I do. In the you book, do address book, this. You address yeah. the need for greater law enforcement and greater authority uh, that to be given not only to our military leaders, not to tie their hands, but also to law right. enforcement. Uh, General, that is just about all the time that we've got okay. today. But I, I do want to uh, mention the book again. It's called Field of Flight. If you haven't picked Field up your flight. copy, go to Amazon right now. Do it right now. Uh, and before we say goodbye to you, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our country and for taking time to speak with us today. Thank you, General Flynn. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Anytime and have me on again. I love it. Absolutely. Uh, you, you're welcome anytime, General. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or comment to make about our interview with General Michael Flynn, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are all over the Internet, easy to reach. And if you missed the full interview with Flynn or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from Apple iTunes, Podbean, our YouTube channel, and also our website at RebeccaCosta.com. My guest next week, the powerhouse behind Bill Clinton's successful campaign, Mr. James Carville, will be here to talk about the high unfavorability ratings of the candidates, too many undecided voters, and what we can expect to see between now and Election Day. So mark your calendars. That's James Carville next week right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to The Costa Report. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Hi, I'm Steve Hendricks with the Santa Cruz Follies, inviting you to attend our 61st annual musical show, September 14th through 17th, at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium. This year's title is Happy Days Are Here Again, with a Frank Sinatra tribute. Matinees at 1, September 14th through 17th, plus a 7.30 evening show, Friday, September 16th. For tickets and information, call 831-423-6640, or go to santacruzfollies.net. Sponsored in part by KSCO. It's always open house at the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, and you are always invited to walk right in and join the discussion. Hello, I am Mike Young, and I love talking real estate with all the experts and with you. So get a jump on the Real Estate Weekend every Friday, 7 p.m. on the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, right here on Listen and Be Heard Radio KSCO. The Mike Young Real Estate Hour is brought to you by Thunderbird Real Estate, Real People Selling Real Estate, by Rick Williams at American Pacific Mortgage, and by Steve Manville at Farmers Insurance. Friday at 7. See you then. Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.